All right, so welcome everyone to Crypto for Accountants webinar. Now we're fortunate enough to have three experts um, on the panel. We've had a lot of interest. As you can see, we've got 60 people in the audience. Meant to have a lot more. So look, we've had a lot of interest in the webinar, and I guess the reason behind that is, you know, uh, according to the stats, we've got one in four Australians or something like that holding some sort of crypto assets. And um, according to chain analysis, total transaction volume grew to 15.8 trillion in 2021, up 567% from 2020. On the dark side of that, you know, there's 7.8 billion worth of crypto that was stolen through different scams, and that's up 82%. So we, we can see crypto is definitely growing exponentially. And on the flip side, you know, one in four holding it, but there's probably what, like, one in a hundred accountants that actually know enough about crypto to be able to, you know, give proper advice. Maybe one in a thousand. I don't know what the numbers, what those numbers are. Uh, but we know that a lot of them are feeling quite overwhelmed. Um, as as am I. Every time I look at it, there's some sort of new kind of acronym that comes out. So today we're going to try and bridge the gap um, and ensure that accountants walk away knowing sort of what they should be looking for, um, you know, and, and what they should be advising their clients. So. If we have time, we'll do questions at the end. So if you do have any questions, just type them in the chat as we go along, and I'll try and kind of go through it. Um, now, uh, I can see a question already. So look, let's start by getting everyone to quickly introduce themselves. I'll start off with myself. So look, I'm an accountant turned you know, public practice recruiter. I've been doing that for about 15 years now, do business coaching and help accounting firms with sort of providing a business advisory part to their clients as well. Uh, and obviously run the Accountants Exposed podcast, which is you know, how many of you guys are here today. So, um, we'll probably do it in Danny, Greg, Michael kind of order. Um, if you guys can quickly mention sort of what your journey with crypto has been and, you know, who you are as well. And then we'll get started. Sure. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me on. And, yeah, I suppose just to kick off, I'm Danny Talwar, Head of Tax here at Coinly. First started getting involved in crypto around 2020. Um, at that point, you know, that's perhaps slightly late to the party. Lots of people had started investing in crypto. Cryptos like Bitcoin, Ethereum were becoming more and more mainstream. Uh, but at the same time, in the professional context, I began working with a lot of clients in the crypto space, um, in, in, in the international tax space, specifically around transfer pricing. Um, started off in London and moved to Sydney nearly five years ago now. Um, I started working with a lot of multinationals in the crypto space and started getting a lot of opportunities with them and quickly realized they don't want to deal with accountants and advisors who don't necessarily understand how they actually earn revenue, how they make money, how they seek to kind of play out a long-term future in the industry. Um, and that was the same kind of time that I was starting to grapple with. Um, decisions on investments in the crypto space myself. So I just very quickly used um, the work setting to get up to speed with crypto, blockchain, the technology around it, and, and kind of went from there. I think one of the main things for me was just seeing how passionate people are in those startup crypto firms and wanting to be part of that. So here I am today at Coinly. Okay. Thank you for that, Danny. Yeah, my name is Michael Pacina. I head up the blockchain group at Piper Alderman Lawyers. So I've been practicing exclusively in cryptocurrencies, digital assets and blockchain for nearly seven years now. Um, and my journey in, in the space started shortly before I started practicing full time in the space. So I went in with um, um, both feet together and jumped in. So I work obviously as many lawyers do closely with accountants and have tried to do my part to help educate um, people because there's a huge gap out there in the education and being a um, transformative technology, a lot of the nuances that come out both for lawyers and accountants uh, and all uh, professional services providers is understanding at a high level what this can do, what it can't do, mm. because a lot of things flow from there. There's obviously a, a lot of detail and we've got some excellent um, people coming at it from with Danny and Greg in the accounting side. Um, and you've run a business as well in that space, haven't you? Well, that's right. I did a year of accounting before I ran Screaming From It at university, and back then I also <laughs> ran a um, technology startup doing MySQL and databasing website development yeah. way back when. I yeah. um, thankfully had an exit to a client in 2003 and have um, thankfully kept my hands in the tech pool since. 
projects and have been really blessed to be involved with a, with a range of really great people involved in the blockchain industry. It's an incredibly welcoming and friendly industry, so um, mm. people can get involved and learn really fast, faster than you ever could before, with the <laughs> amount of resources available online. So Excellent. we advise from, in the whole range from taking some of the, the thornier tax issues that come from um, the accounting side through to helping people get um, tokens analyzed for the financial services risk, um, through to NFTs, which are a fabulous new product and exploding onto the scene in a very high-profile way, and everything in between, because there's lots of little quirks that come out. We run our group as an industry group trying to deal with everything that, that crypto and blockchain companies need and understanding the technology in a deep way to help do that. Yep. And Greg? Um, thanks, Michael. Well, we've been in the space uh, since 2016. My background is the ATO, then public practice, um, I'm Managing Director of Vale's Accountants now. Um, the way that we uh, we came into it in a, a very ironic way, we had a, a, someone wanting to raise, who raised actually 15 million US uh, for an ICO and wanted to understand tax law and compliance and ASIC rules. So we got our heads around all of that back in that day and then we were able to then forge a pretty good niche in, in the understanding and now we're really advising across the whole sector in compliance um, and uh, corporate governance, uh, from the DAOs, the NFTs, gaming, all aspects of the blockchain Web3 industry. We still do Web2 as well. And I think it's important to understand that someone that's had that Web2 understanding and tax law and principles, and we do a bit of international tax law as well, uh, in terms of Germany, UK, US at the moment, and we have, can transfer that knowledge readily into this Web3 dynamic and understanding. And you've got to take the time to research, understand, learn. Um, it was an intellectual journey for us and we, and we enjoyed it and now it's become quite uh, prevalent in our practice. And uh, we have great relationships with uh, uh, lawyers and, and pipers and Michael and myself and Danny come in my office. So it's quite a good and encouraging community. And if people are trying to get into this, understand that there's a lot of people willing to help and assist uh, because there's plenty of work uh, for everyone in this industry um, and uh, it's mm. a caring nature to help the clients. Yeah, 100%. Um, do, do any of you guys own monkey NFTs or, you know, secretly Bitcoin whales? Or? <laughs> no? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be nice? Uh, look, <laughs> I, I, I've, I got into a few things thankfully early enough, but I'm not planning on selling anything soon, and I've had a couple of NFTs that I was delighted to find when I went to do my taxes. Oh, hey, someone wants to buy it, and and managed to sell a few things at a little bit of money, but um, none, I don't think any of the three here are driving Lamborghinis at this point, let's put it that way. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> look, I, I guess accountants are stereotypically very risk-averse. That's probably why, as much as you know, we all know enough about it. None of you guys uh, are driving Lamborghinis yet. Well, I don't know about Greg. Greg is a bit silent there, so who knows? <laughs> um, but Greg, you you have ended up with 50% of your practice now crypto related, um, which is a you know a, a phenomenal kind of development. Um, why should accountants sit up and pay attention to something that they probably have always looked at as a fad, a hype, something young people lose their money in, uh, and something kind of, you know, um, dodgy criminals use for money laundering? You know, yeah. why should they be kind of paying attention to crypto? Um, because I think you'll see, Michael, with the industry that we've been uh, dealing with, uh, we don't have anything of such. I mean, everyone that's a client is quite heavily regulated, uh, doing all the right things and doing quite well. And uh, particularly some of these, you know, we've got some NFT clients that are earning over $60 million in, in revenue. We've got uh, people that are into gaming. We've got an all legitimate, all doing some really great things. And the, the issue that I think that accountants and lawyers that have to take onto account with this is that a lot of Web2 businesses will be looking eventually how Web3 apply to them. And if you're not well equipped to understand that conduit or that link, it's going to leave you behind a fair bit, um, I think. And just to have a slow understanding of it, and it's going to be some time, and I think we compare the Web2 industry of the internet um, um, and Web3 is going to be as big, if not even bigger than that. And we, we, I mean, 
whether people are dealing in cryptocurrencies um, and and how how better to do things in this in the Web3 environment. We don't advise on cryptocurrencies. We don't advise who, what they should pick. We don't do any of that. The clients are very educated, and and we make sure that we encourage the clients to be educated in what they're doing. We don't want them to lose their mm. money. And what are they building? And what are they doing? So there's a lot of that intellectual discussion and the structuring. Uh, we might do, uh, get them to someone to look at their tokenomics, someone to look at their white paper, someone to look at the dynamics and, and profit-making understanding, and because a lot of them are very brilliant in what they do, but they don't have commercial awareness, and that's where we come in quite, yeah. quite well. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And, and just to give context for everyone, like what Greg does when I say 50% of his practices, he focuses mostly on the actual companies that produce, you know, whether they do ICOs, so, you know, uh, coin offerings or actual companies, you know, might be opening up an exchange or some sort of interesting tech business in the blockchain space. So that would that be an accurate kind that's, of interpretation? Yeah. That's correct. Or an NFT, um, gaming, or DAO. Correct. And uh, um, Michael, I mean, we've heard a lot of terms being thrown around just now, like DAO and NFTs and all of that. Um, and look, practitioners, uh, as we've discussed, like the average age of a practitioner is, you know, late 40s, 50s these days. Um, can you just kind of paint uh, what the landscape is, just sort of a, a brief overview of what all these things mean and, you know, what what, what a typical accountant should definitely be aware of instead of, you know, listening, listening or hearing all these terms and wanting to run away into the metaversal cave and hide... Running away from the metaverse, okay, the yeah. regular cave. But I, I'd echo what Greg said. It's it's just the internet again, and it's most simple. But what is this so, Web 3.0? People are like never even heard of Web 2.0. Now it's 3.0. <laughs> so we're, so the, so at a high level, Web 1 was you know the the 90s internet, right? Things got a bit crazy and hyped with Pets.com and other things in the dot com boom, and and so we had you know. Uh, MySpace and other things slowly coming on the scene, but Web One was very simple websites, the start of Google, all, you know, AOL, Yahoo, really basic websites, everything a bit janky, crazy flying toasters and things like that. And many of those who are listening today will probably say, thankfully, if they're young enough, what the hell was that? I don't know about it. <laughs> Great, you dodged it. It was the good old days where things you did that were caught on photo wouldn't end up online and haunt you forever. Um, nice but then static pages, right? <laughs> exactly. So then web, you know, I, I had a personal web page. I called it Mike's Fun Page. And I had a little 300 by 150 images, right? So back then, that was a good <laughs> size. But today, that would be like this big on the screen and just, you know, so it's all horribly outdated. Web 2 is the rise of social media where, you know, you saw early on MySpace and then taken over by Facebook and, and also the rise of, you know, the fangs and Amazon becoming super powerful and these very big platforms. Uh, lots of products where um, the makers of those products might be losing money hand over fist to try and seek a monopoly position, um, but also lots of free products where the old where the saying came from, if the product's free, you are the product. So lots of collection <laughs> of data, lots of things that you got for free, but also you gave up a lot of stuff to participate in that. Um, so privacy pretty much stomped all over. Web3 is a loose term that's been applied to uh, pro to the use of blockchain tech to enable new products and new ways of individual users gaining power in how they um, deal with them with things online and um, particularly the companies they deal with online. So that for, for the simplest example, cryptocurrencies make it very easy to, have, to make a ledger entry of something of value, whatever the hell that is, whether it's a Bitcoin or an NFT or something. Mm -hmm. um, being able to have a, a ledger entry that you can move around without having to go through a central controller of that ledger is a bit alien. So from the accountant perspective, it's, you know, imagine, a, imagine an accounting ledger that, every, that a whole bunch of people have access to, but only, re, only um, write only access. So no one can change what's happened in the past, but they can all append new entries if they have the appropriate um, passwords. That's essentially a blockchain. But being able to do that in a collective way that doesn't require waiting on, in the classic example, a bank to update an account entry you know, many of those here would remember the bad old days of checks and waiting for payments to clear. And even today with the NPP and things, mm. you know, weirdly you have a situation where on, in, in the bank I bank with, it's faster for me to send my money to another bank on NPP and then back to a different account at my first bank than to transfer between my accounts at the bank. I don't know why, but, you know, there's time taking on ledgers that, that, is, that is slow. So Web3 is about using the power of these distributed ledgers 
to enable new products and new services which essentially have greater efficiency and automation than ever before. That's what yeah. the, the high-level stuff is. So it's really interesting business models that never existed before. NFTs are a brand new um, technology that enables products that we've just never been able to do before because of the lowering of cost. Another good example I give to accountants is once upon a time, spreadsheets were insanely expensive and done by hand. Then, you know, uh, we had computerized spreadsheets that came along and reduced the cost of updating a manual spreadsheet to essentially nothing. And the result of that was, of course, everybody uses spreadsheets for, for various things that are, that are simpler done in a spreadsheet than in an accounting, a piece of accounting software. Uh, and it's the same thing. It's about making certain steps and processes so cheap to do that you, the business models that previously didn't make sense make sense. Can you give a great example. example. Yeah. I'll give you an example. One of our clients, um, a company called Ligon, who I've also invested in, um, came along, spoke to a bunch of banks who invested in them and said, everybody hates bank guarantees. They're paper-based, bare instruments that, you, that someone has to put forward for a commercial lease. Many accountants would have clients who have commercial leases and they need to put up a bank guarantee often for their lease. Everybody hates them. They suck. You've got to go to the bank. You've got to wait for the bank to issue it. You've got to pay some fees. Then you've got to give that piece of paper to someone who then mm. has to keep it safe because if they lose it, they've just lost that amount of money. And it's really painful if it, if it has to be called up, it's expensive to get lawyers involved. So this company said, guess what? We could use a blockchain tech to completely tokenize and issue these bank guarantees digitally. And a few people have tried that, but it never stuck. Why did it never stick? Because one party would control the system and say, you have to go on our platform to use this digital thing. Whereas these guys, the Ligon project, have said, this is a common platform using IBM Hyperledger. Everyone's agreed to use the same standard. Yes, it's still their product, but because it's a common standard, there's a lot more control for the customers, in this case, the bank. What it means is multiple banks can have an interface, which some of them are still coming down the pipeline, so that you could issue a bank guarantee by push of a button from internet banking. The landlords receiving the bank guarantees, or whoever needs to get it, can receive that security digitally, mm -hmm. knowing full well that the bank who signed the transaction is legitimately standing behind it. If um, it needs to be called upon, it's a push of a button away, but it's not a centralized proprietary technology with, with really easy points of failure. It's sitting on this permissioned blockchain that's much more resilient. So if there's an outage at Ligon, it doesn't matter because the IBM Hyperledger is more resilient than that. And their information is protected in that case because it's not a public blockchain. So it's a bit of a nuance away from where it's Ethereum and Bitcoin and things like that. You can see every transaction that any wallet has ever done. Yeah, and that's that's a that's a double-edged sword. Fantastic for people who want to investigate and prevent crime, because once you know who owns a wallet, you can track it. Really, really bad if you don't want people to know what you've done and what you've spent things on. Um, so, having a permission chain is a way of solving that. It makes it makes a better adoption of standards. How so mainstream that's, that's, is that? Like, for example, that application with bank guarantees. Is so that we have four we have four of the biggest banks in the country who are rolling onto it, plus Center Group. So. Um, Rolling up to it or have actually started using it? Uh, we have pilots pushing out on it, so they're still testing okay. it with internal systems. Being banks, they go slow. They want to make sure it's all going to work really, really well. But any process at the moment which is manual and involves paper is highly likely to be a candidate for a shift to blockchain. Things that have already been automated and work really well on common systems, it's a bit more to just, harder to justify the cost, but that's, that's a rule of thumb. And, mm. and bank guarantees tick the box everywhere there. Nobody likes them. They're a necessary evil. But this takes away all the pain points and enables people to manage them in a cheaper way. The other big example is foreign exchange, where um, making, making payments through SWIFT costs a lot of money and Forex transactions cost a lot of money. Those are, are very heavily moved into blockchain systems now. RippleNet has... I think 800 banks in it now running in the background. So people don't even know that Forex transactions are now sliding increasingly onto blockchain systems simply because it's faster and cheaper. And that's the driver. And that's what we want. No one needs to know that it's um, using a blockchain system in the background. They only see the front end interface and it works. And those ones are nice and easy. No change for accountants, but it's worth seeing these things happening because they'll have clients who are dealing in interesting mm. products that take advantage of this technology in the same way that in the 90s and early 2000s, people came along and said, I'm doing a new thing involving the internet. And accountants <laughs> had to go, right, how do we account for spending in this interesting way that technology enables transactions that didn't um, pop up much before? And, uh, like, I remember reading, I think the other day, um, there have been a couple of properties around the world that have been sold as an NFT, uh, <laughs> minted as an NFT, like real poems. Um, so that's the thing. And then there's a company that I came across, Vesta Equity, that's allowing people to release equity from their homes. 
um, through some interesting token system. So it, I guess I'm trying to see are there other examples um, that are that will have an impact on accounting firm clients that actually need to be aware of some real business. Well, I think what's coming down the pipeline issues. is a lot of royalty or revenue sharing related tokens, which create very interesting accounting challenges as to when the recognition of revenue might ha might occur because that's something that this technology enables to occur in an automated way. A lot of NFT companies which issue NFTs then take a clip of the secondary sale and due to how the technology works, that clip of the secondary sale is fully automated with no party in charge of it. It's essentially how the entire copyright royalties industry works, which currently now relies upon a small handful of companies processing who's playing music in restaurants mm. and who's signing up for the licenses. That is all getting automated very, very fast which means you have interesting transactions around things like royalties that can go in all sorts of places. A standard was released on Ethereum recently to enable NFTs to be loaned out and rented out. And that gets very close to saying, okay, why don't we manage the rental of other things using tokens because it creates a very nice accounting technological point to say, okay, we can do this and represent things on tokens instead of saying, right, here was, a, here was, a, here was some kind of lease or we have to use Airbnb to rent out this um, house. We can do something else. There's a, mm. there's a company that makes lock boxes which tell a blockchain when they are opened and closed, which is a perfect use case for someone wanting to rent out a holiday house. It's an out-of-the-box um, literal box with, where a key <laughs> goes in it that will tell the blockchain and record when it was opened and closed. That ties into a lot of different applications. But then tying into accounting is, okay, great, we know when people went in, in or out for a, for a rental. Even yeah. that simple kind of thing enables, okay, instead of doing a 24-hour rental, charge people by the hour for while they're using a a holiday place if, if that works in the market. We don't know. There's a lot of really interesting products and poor accountants and lawyers are at the forefront of trying to figure out how to get existing standards and existing regulation to apply to these really innovative products that are being pushed out. Mm. I mean, it's constantly evolving. and It's incredible just like how difficult it must be for you guys to wrap your heads around it and, and keep on top of it. Um, you know, and then especially you, Michael, like some of the clients you mentioned before that you, that you advise on, you 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 probably at the very frontier of all this. Um, I guess, uh, Danny, a question for you. I mean, you know, there's a whole bunch of applications in it, um, and there's all, you know, from from a business perspective, there's businesses coming up with really cool tech around blockchain. But then there's you know, just regular ordinary consumers looking at it as a potential investment or wealth growing option as well. And there's a myriad of options there, right? There's you know, you can buy NFTs, you can buy, you know, crypto and just trade like you would with any other assets. Um, you can stake stuff and, and, and income, blah, 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 like the, there's millions of options. Um, what are some of the common sort of misconceptions people have, and especially maybe accountants have, um, when it comes to some, some yeah, of these options? So I think, options? firstly, Michael, there's a couple of things there to think, there to think of. So one of them is, when you talk about crypto and blockchain, there's really two separate things to consider. I think from an investment perspective, so from an invest from an investable asset perspective, you know, there's various projects out there and you know, like like traditional stocks and shares, you know, people will go and they they'll do their research and typically what they'll find is a coin or token represents a project. Uh it might be a web three project, um, it might not be a web three project. Um, but underlying these coins and tokens is typically this blockchain technology, and the features of those of that technology is generally it will be decentralized, or there'll be an aim to decentralize it without having, you know, a common or a central intermediary that has control of data or decides who can participate or who can't participate. Um, and so I think the first thing to consider is probably that that difference there and. We are in really early stages. So, you know, Michael mentioned the concept of tokenization. You know, there's a lot of real life assets now being tokenized onto blockchains. You know, things like real gold. So Paxos, for example, um, are a company that have their gold token, Pax Gold. And I think one token is equivalent to essentially one ounce of, of gold, which you can actually redeem. You can you can take delivery of that gold if you want to. Um but the di you know, the, the mm -hmm. difference there is that it's actually stored on a blockchain um, in terms of the records, and um, suddenly you get 
you get this ledger um, as we've spoken about before. So I think they're the kind of two concepts. Um, mm -hmm. I think in terms of misconceptions, I mean, there's there's certainly a lot on the accountant side in terms of that value around um, crypto and blockchain. I think, you know, just going back to what we said earlier around the scams and uh, really there's an onus on accountants to act, to kind of dive into some of the areas or the concepts that client their clients are into to really try and understand their intentions. You know, Greg gave some good examples there about, you know, the clients he's working on who genuine, gen, generally are, um, you know, honest businesses trying to make a, a living in this new space. We're in very, very early stages at the moment. And so there's various niches being carved out and just seeing the different areas is really interesting. In terms of, uh, I guess, you know, you, you spoke, uh, you gave us an overview. What about actual like tax obligations that result from all these investment options? Like, um, you know, are we, what, what, what are most accountants kind of finding and what, what are most of the issues that your sort of consumer clients are, are facing uh, at Coinly? So I think a lot of people just like think about exchanges and they think about how much money and some of them are, you know, <laughs> saying I made $4 million with, you know, Dogecoin or whatever. Very few people are talking about the fact that they've also theoretically racked up a very significant tax obligation. Yeah, definitely. So there's a few misconceptions, I think, firstly on you know, client side around how crypto is taxed and confusion, and particularly at the moment when people might be sitting on losses, whether those losses can be used to be offset against salary and wages, for example. And... I think I think it comes back to from an accountant perspective, you know, we're dealing with law and guidance from the ATO that isn't significantly different to other asset classes that we've seen. So first and foremost, you know, if you're an investor, CGT is is likely to apply, right? And and for businesses, the trading stock rules um, apply. Now, one of these one of the interesting areas I think that crypto comes into is this gray area in the middle which is you know isolated profit making transactions and the reason i mention it in the context of crypto is because it's so easy to trade crypto now people can do it you know particularly in lockdowns you know greg might might have seen this with his client base but lots of people just trading crypto on mobile apps uh, very very casually very easily in the click of a button creating taxable events yeah. you know it's so easy to switch between coin to coin, uh, which is so different to, I suppose, more traditional assets where typically, you know, purchase an asset like a share, wait for the funds to clear, get your chest certificate. And if you want to sell it, you generally wait for the proceeds to come through and then buy something else. So with crypto, you can just exchange these in, 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 in seconds. And so what that means is the volume of transactions mm. is typically very, very high in comparison to an ordinary share investor let's say um, and so that threshold as to when uh, someone changes from being an ordinary investor to a business can come into question and i think what the ato has come out and said is well actually you know volume yes volume might be one factor but there's a, a, a ton of other factors like intentions are they conducting activities in a business-like manner etc that contribute to to those arguments so that's just one of the interesting issues that we're seeing at the moment Okay, and just to do basics, like is, you know, so say I made money or lost money, is is all crypto capital gains or is it income? You know, what, what is kind of the the biggest differentiator between a trader and investor? Because I'm pretty sure, most, especially now with the huge losses some people will be taking, I'm sure that many would love to write it yeah, off. Yeah, so there's a few things it depends on. Again, it's not it's not different to other CGT assets or you know, shares, these are, these are issues that accountants have faced for many years now. But things like the nature of the activities, you know, understanding clients' intentions when they're holding crypto is really important. It's not just getting that report from software providers on here are my crypto transactions, but it's actually understanding, you know, why are you trading crypto? Um, what is there a business strategy in place? Uh, how much capital has been invested up front? Is, is that indicative of a business? Are there business partners and is there a strategy involved? And those are, those are factors that will tip you more into the trader category. Um, and I think the key point there is just 
just to say that high volume doesn't necessarily constitute uh, a trader. And and so for and so traders will be treated under the trading set mm-hmm. rules. And for investors, capital gains regime will apply. Um, and so that's most likely for individuals, people that are trading casually. They, crypto is not their main source of income. Um, they invest crypto on the side. They hold it for a personal yeah. investment. I know there was the issue of um, the personal use 10K limit. Can you kind of elaborate a bit more on that? Because I think many people think they could just go and buy laptops or, or, or trade things as long as it's under 10 grand and not worry about declaring anything. Yeah, so is that I the think case? That, I think that's right. I think that is a misconception again. Because generally, and the ATO have given a couple of examples on this, and they are slightly contrived, but I think they're telling off the ATO's views. So it, with the rise in spending cards associated with crypto accounts at the moment, you know, people are actually able to have debit-like cards that are linked to their crypto balance. And so they can go and spend that in groceries, on coffee shops, etc. And you know, a lot of people think under this personal use asset rule, if it's under 10K, it's, it's outside the scope of capital gains. But the ATO have been quite clear that they view crypto as an investment. So generally, it's very, very difficult to fall into that personal use asset rule unless you specifically acquired the crypto for that personal use asset and you spend it in a very, very quick space of time. So generally mm-hmm. there, the, the telling factor will be the length of time you've held crypto. So if I, if I held Ethereum in my, in my account you know, for a number of years and I decide to spend a portion of it on a coffee, that doesn't necessarily mean that's a personal use asset because I've actually held the asset as an investment. I've just decided to dispose of it. So, so that, that generally is a common... And that way. would be a tax mm-hmm. event, yeah. especially if, you know, the, the disposal, yeah. Okay. And what about staking? I know it's one thing that um, not everyone's got their head around, which is kind of part of DeFi. Um, is that, would you just call it equivalent to dividends in a share? In terms of the tax treatment, you just look at it like that, yes. Um, you know, the concept of staking, locking away a portion of your funds um, for that particular protocol or blockchain um, to validate additional transactions generally means you're you know, fronting some crypto up front, locking it away with the with the opportunity to get future rewards or income-like rewards. Uh, so generally these concepts where there's an earning mm-hmm. involved, you know, if you're earning additional coins or tokens, uh, the ATO will treat that as ordinary income outside the scope of capital gains tax. I think something to note there is, you know, it's easy to talk about staking in quite a vanilla context, you know, there are, and, 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 with the rise of DeFi and decentralized finance, we're seeing a lot more complex interactions with staking. And so, you know, market value becomes very, very difficult in some cases to actually work out, you know, timing. If, you, if you've earned staking rewards, but you don't necessarily mm. have access to it, uh, but it's in your account, you know, what's the timing associated with that? Is it when you can actually spend it or dispose of it? Or is it showing in your account? Is that the point at which you... You, you convert to AUD. So, so the point to note there is that there's a lot of complexities which are yet to be hashed out. And hopefully we'll see some of that come through in the Board of Taxation Review. There's a consultation round coming out hopefully in the next few weeks and the Board of Taxation due to deliver um, a report by the end of the year. Well, what are the tax tips then for this year? Because obviously it's you know past 30th of June. Um, uh, I don't know how Coinly and, and their software or crypto tax calculator kind of accounts for it, but w- what, how should an accountant account for you know staking revenue? Is it just revenue that's been earned? Is it once it's converted back from you know um, the the special tokens back to you know the the original holding? W- when do you and how do you account for it? And also the other question I had was for the CGT. I think someone asked me was you know what tax code do you use for that for gains? Um, you know, when, you, when yeah. you're doing attack so, returns. First one, in terms of staking, again, you know, that there are various levels of complexities there. So firstly, understand what your clients are doing um, and, and really understand, you know, what type of protocols they're using. Uh, the, the, the ATO guidance is very vanilla. So generally it's market value at the time it's earned. 
um, and, and you then convert to AUD. I think what's really important is keeping good records, obviously. Um, you can use software to keep those records. I'd re obviously recommend it because using spreadsheets is very, very quickly a nightmare in the crypto space, given the amount of transactions you can rack up. Well, uh, it looks yeah very convoluted. It looks like a compliance well, nightmare. Well, it, 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 the, the amount of it is Michael events, from our uh, point of view because we, as as the practitioners, we we utilise Coinly and Crypto Tax Calculator, but you're still going to have to extract the nuances of transactions that occur, whether it's staking, airdrops, or bridging, mm -hmm. or wrapping. Um, there are very much a lot of decipher that you're going to have to and nuances that you're going to have to establish other than what the software provides. And, and Danny and uh, Shane know that. And, and, and it's the practitioners that have to still, with any other transactions, have to understand the nature and characteristics of transactions because there's a lot of breaking ground, especially I think Mike and I were overseas in Austin, Texas and New York and seeing what people are doing internationally as well. There are groundbreaking stuff happening within all of the aspects of of transactions and what's occurring. There's fundamentals with tax law that you can apply, um, mm -hmm. and you need to, uh, and those that legislation that's not there, you have to ensure that you have a reasonably argued position as to why, how you're going to be treating it. And so to give a blanket um, um, suggestion on, oh, it's all going to be treated, I think you're going to have to look at those transactions, uh, particularly in their nature. And some, as, as Danny said, there's, there's hundreds of thousands. We've done hundreds of thousands of transactions for clients and trying to find. And, and one of the major issues, Michael, that they that their clients are not all, uh, being aware of, particularly with the cryptocurrency, is that they may earn um, a profit and then um, swapping into another cryptocurrency. There's a, there's a, a deemed disposal at that time. Um, and if it's a CGT event, and then what mainly occurs is what we'd say to clients, Understand what your tax position is by the end of that financial year. Otherwise, you're going to have to find that if the cryptocurrency has dropped significantly, that you're going to have a liability and no money to put aside. So we get people to, when we have that tax planning time, to put away money into a, a stable <laughs> coin, um, uh, not with preferably uh, nothing with uh, an algorithm associated with it. But, uh, but um, <laughs> we just want to make sure that people are thinking quite positively about their tax planning and putting aside the provision of tax and understanding that there are a lot of detail and nuances for, for this and it's just not an easy, it's an easy ride uh, in, in relation to the cryptocurrency extract, extrapolation for compliance recording. So what, what are some oh, frameworks so around that, Greg, that you've been well, find with that, your um, clients? Well, we find that clients are either um, uh, wrapping a token um, clients who uh, and don't understand. Well, can you can you define can you define that? Because I don't know whether many people understand right, bridging well, and wrapping. Michael, and you're great with the definitions, but I might I'm, I can tell you what the definition of the uh, thing. So, <laughs> Michael, you want to explain the um, the wrapping and the um, and the bridging. And by the way, just Michael, before you start, for the audience, look, if, if there's something that doesn't make sense to so you, have a specific query that, or a specific interesting situation that you've come across, then just put it in the chat. We might bring it up. Yeah, I think we're seeing some really interesting things pop up in the chat um, around the trading rules and whatnot. Um, um, so looking at definitionals, a classic example of, say, wrapping is where somebody wishes to, you know, te these are all technologically yeah. driven things generally done without regard for what the this, you know, quote unquote, real world consequences are. So a classic example is Bitcoin can only transact using the Bitcoin um, blockchain. Ethereum, um, or Ether as it's technically known, but a lot of people just call it Ethereum, ETH can only be used on the Ethereum blockchain. However, uh, people have worked out a technological way to wrap Bitcoin uh, such that you can freeze up some Bitcoin on the Bitcoin blockchain and put a representation of it onto the Ethereum blockchain as wrapped Bitcoin, so that then you could spend that Bitcoin on the Ethereum blockchain and someone can go back and unlock it and move it back into the Bitcoin blockchain. So it's really a technological solution that looks an awful lot like how do you move foreign currencies between each other, but mm. rather than doing a straight swap for it, which you could also do, you could sell one Bitcoin and buy the same equivalent amount of ETH, but people like to transact. So it's sort of a way of almost having an Australian dollar representation of a US dollar that always keeps its US dollar value 
Mm. But it, but is in denominated in the Australian dollar, so it can move around our system. So it messes with people's heads. <laughs> be like, but that doesn't make any sense in the money sense. And be like, yes, because our technology banknotes don't work that way, but they do work that way on blockchain. You can wrap something up and say, here it is. And even on the Ethereum blockchain, there's also wrapped ETH, which is a simply a version of ETH wrapped up in in another form of token, so that it can be transacted in a slightly cheaper way. So there's a lot of this technological advancement that that creates these challenges then because then there's questions to say, well, hang on a minute, is one form of currency to get it on another um, blockchain triggering CGT problems? Uh, when does GST apply? How does it apply? Uh, and these are, tr these are tricky issues that no one thought about when they were doing the technology. We've also seen some projects doing um, token swaps where they've used one token for their project, for example, for voting rights, and they've said, well, now that token's got a technological restriction that we don't like, so we're gonna replace it with another token and these things have value by that point. When they started, it was all worth nothing. And then when they decide to do the switch, the token might be worth 50 cents a token or something. And so there's real questions about, well, hang on a minute, CGT rollovers and CGT um, rules are quite a design for a world where this was just not possible to have a thing that you could just technologically swap over. And of course, the people doing the swap say, we're doing it for technological reasons. It's not really creating or disposing of an asset, but the ATO may not see it that way. Mm. It might say, well, hang on a minute, when you're asking people to deposit one token in a little piece of code and they get another token out the other end, looks an awful lot like the exact same way you trade them. Um, but there's, you know, looking at the whole transaction and figuring out how does the technological piece reflect the law is hard and is very case by case. And we, we work a, a lot on that bleeding edge with excellent um, accountants, with people like Greg and Danny, on trying to figure out what is the reasonably arguable position. And there's a, a lot of trying to work out where does it sit. And unfortunately, there's still a, a lot of education gap. Even if you go onto the ATO user forums, you'll find completely contradictory positions taken by the ATO all over the place. So for accountants, unfortunately, that was that's a really good resource for lots of things, but be very careful with it when it comes to crypto and blockchain because you can find that different position, which the ATO still needs to go back and clean up. Which is part of the taxation review, I'd imagine. Potentially, I don't know how deep they'll go into it, but, but it'll be really interesting to see what comes out of that review and how the rules are set because they'll have very big consequences for how people are doing business. And we also have the added quirk that never before has it been so easy for people to set up companies in foreign jurisdictions and move their business offshore because uh, so much cryptocurrency is now being transacted in stable coins that you're rapidly seeing in the space a point where Perhaps it was difficult if, if you wanted to set up a company in America. Okay, you've got to get your bank accounts, and there's a lot of cost. But if you're going to transact in crypto, there's near no cost of accepting crypto and having digital wallets. They can be set up in moments. So it's very, very easy for people to get on a plane and move overseas and set something up fast yeah. um, or set it up from here overseas. And that creates added complexities under our tax rules, of course, with residency and figuring out where things are. So the technology is moving so fast and the rules don't keep up. And that, and that creates a lot, of, a lot of work for people to deal with and try and find some basic guidance for people dealing, having these things come in the door to say, right, what can I deal with and what do I need to call a specialist on? Mm -hmm. Because you obviously don't need to go to a heart surgeon if you need a regular checkup. You, and you don't need to pay for that either. But if you do, if you do need to have a heart surgeon come and look at you, that's very <laughs> important. Just on that yeah. concept. Yeah. Right. Sorry, Danny, you were going to say? Right. Essentially right. using non-native tokens on any blockchain. I think from an accounting perspective, you know, does does tran transferring ETH to wrapped ETH actually constitute a disposal? And there's ATO community forums that have suggested, you know, the ATO do view this as a disposal. Uh, I think this is something that is up for debate because are you are you holding a fundamentally or economically different asset to what you held before? Uh, a change in beneficial ownership rules. You know, I think. Those are the types of complexities that accountants are grappling with at the moment. And you know, as Greg said, the Probably. software providers... Danny, the, the ATR is saying that um, wrapping a token creates a different asset for CGT purposes. Yeah. They're pretty adamant on that. Um, and this is, this is what we're, we're trying to, to grapple with, with the ATO view on, on certain things and bridging in all of those types of um, transactions. And only... Mm -hmm. Just one more okay. point, Michael, I want to make um, about, particularly with airdrops and clients, what we've found that uh, clients get these rewards with these airdrops, and um, which automatically come from their, um, their, their tokens that they received, etc. They have to be very sure, and we, we've got this with some clients that came through, that some of these airdrops aren't necessarily what they think they are. 
and they've got to be very careful what they're accepting. And this is a difficulty with some of these things that's been put into people's mm-hmm. wallets. What are you accepting? Who's giving it to? Why are they giving it to? What's the nature of it? I mean, ATO is saying it's income, but these are the things that really no one's going to pick up unless you go through the detail and understand what that represents. And this is happening quite often we're seeing that. Um, and there's not many uh, 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 software that's picking any of that stuff up. And this is about the detail and nuances that the, uh, that the accountants have to look at and lift up the hood and find what the, de- the detail is. And we, we, we impose very strongly as uh, crypto tax accountants that our working papers, and this is what's important for all accountants that are listening to this, is that with, and they know their 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 uh, bread and butter with this in working papers, but it's so crucial with mixing up uh, cryptocurrency in working papers as to what has occurred, and a reasonably argued position when the ATO is coming. And um, I'm I'm catching up with an assistant commission in the next couple of weeks, and I know one of the things that they they're, they're building, and they're going to come very strongly very soon, and will catch up as to all the on ramping and, and ramping off-ramping and on-ramping of transactions. If you think that you're, you're not within the ATO um, um, view, et cetera, um, you'll be pretty much mistaken because even though they might be a couple of years behind, they will catch up and they will look and dissect the transactions. And what we currently do in Web2 is that we download information in the portal. Um, all the accounts would know that. Um, and in Web3, all that information now is starting to come through. And as they plug to all the exchanges, and not just in Australia, around the world, it will it'll all occur, there will be transaction records. And what we implore to people is to sit with the accountant um, who understands it and to be able to make sure they meet their obligations because there's nothing worse than them not understanding what their obligations are. And I'll jump in there to point that we never before have we had so many people of a relatively young age make so much money so quickly. There's been historically this path by of building up, getting experience, working in business. There's a small number of entrepreneurs who've who've made a lot of money very quickly. Mm-hmm. But 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 effectively, I view it as by the time most people were making serious dollars, they were very well trained, if you will, in, into compliance and were and saying, okay, I understand how tax works and I understand what I need to pay. Uh, there is an education piece with clients who come in. We've had people, Greg and I, who've come in off the, literally off the street to come talk to us and they're making silly money because of some crypto thing. And they, one of the strange things among, among some crypto maximalists is they say, right, you've got to pay this amount of tax. And the answer that comes back in response to that comment is something you might hear from a US libertarian. Usually a why, I don't want to. Um, and I just feel that historically lots of people have worked their way through and had PAYG coming off their, you know, they get used to it over time and they get to a point where they might be in a position where, okay, great, they're getting, getting money and they deal with pre-tax, they, they know what to do versus someone coming in who's suddenly fallen into riches um, or, or just significantly higher than they would otherwise have been paid, not understanding um, the consequences of taking a loose approach. And as Greg pointed out, the ATO has done data collection of every single exchange and the local subsidiaries of international exchanges they've got the data matching powers. Um, and so clients who think that it's all very pseudonymous, and one of the biggest um, myths is how is that you know, crypto is anonymous and used by criminals and things. It's not. It's the most tra- one of the most traceable systems ever. Funnily enough, with the announcement of the um, Reserve Bank getting into digital currencies, mm. the West Australian had an article out today saying, oh, no, look at all the tracing that can be done. It's the same newspaper that had articles out saying, oh, no, look at all the criminal use of blockchain. <laughs> Public blockchains are so traceable, you cannot hide shenanigans on them eventually. We say to clients, assume you will be doxxed. There's a word for the accountants. Dox means to, have you, you know, to be identified from an online profile. We say, assume you will be doxxed sooner or later. It might not happen now. It might not happen for a few years. But there's no, there's no statute of limitations on tax fraud. So assume you'll be found out and all your transactions yeah. will become public and act accordingly. And that's a really important message, I think, to get people across versus it being swept under the rug. So getting proper instructions from clients really into the weeds of details of what they've been doing is really important. So there's no limitation Sorry, there's on tax fraud? Yeah. If you're committing yeah. fraud, the ATO can come after you. There's, there's various limitations that apply to certain things, but criminality, does, we don't have, you know, U.S. television has taught us about, you know, oh, it's outside the statute of limitations for murder. It's like, <laughs> no, a lot of that stuff, yeah. and there is none. Like, it's about records. Um, and records on an immutable database that never go away 
are not the kind of thing you wish to have brought against you. Marshall, the, you haven't the, done the right just thing. On that point, just on point. The ACO, sorry, um, Australian Tax Office, has a legislation called, um, or has uh, as powers, which is Part 4A. Now, Part 4A means that they, uh, it's an anti avoid provision, and if you, and then the mm. proof is on the taxpayer to yep. ensure, as you would know, Michael, is, is to ensure that they are not uh, for the purpose, dominant purpose of trying to avoid tax. And in any aspects of that, the burden of proof is on the client to ensure that that's not the case. And hence, you've got to have all your ducks in a row with understanding. And while we're talking about terms and um, what Michael defined so eloquently and Danny explained as well, but there's issues about talking about the staking, the liquidity pools, the yield farming, the child splits. Um, I just mm. did a, a TV education talk on that uh, just the other day, and that's to explain to accountants what all that, what all of that means, and what it means for them as in their, as a practitioner and for the lawyers. And I encourage our audience and accountants to go and learn this. There's a lot of education programs out there, and uh, to learn all those definitions, what they mean, and how it applies um, uh, to their practices. Is there a resource you recommend, Greg? I think, or well, uh, the TV it? education um, uh, one I just did the other day is not bad, <laughs> Michael, so that's coming. <laughs> Natu naturally, <laughs> I expect it to be the best. That's why you're here. And the, and the and podcast. podcast. But yeah. I mean, and, and feel free to reach out too. I mean, all three of us are very open to helping people and understanding and giving them their path. I, I just don't, Michael, I just don't go to one source. There's a lot of sources that are available. And funny enough, I do say to people it's like the um, dummies for cryptocurrency, the dummies. I mean, if you read those books, they're not in any means a dummies for. They've got a lot of technical aspects and nuances on it. And if you take the time to understand some of those terms, and understand the field of it, then you, you'll start to get it. And it takes time. As I said, I've been in it since 2015 and 16, and there's still new stuff coming up in this space. But you've got to have that solid grounding and put in the time like you all, all the practitioners would have done with their tax law and understanding the financials. This is the same. It's actually a whole learning process. And you don't have to be afraid of it. You just have to understand the terms. And once you get used to them, then you'll know how they apply and practically. I think the other yep. thing just okay. to... Danny, you wanted to add something off what before? Was saying that there, there are a lot of Web3 companies at the moment and you know crypto or blockchain companies that have entered the space that recognize there's an education piece needed um, to bring their following along with them and also to introduce newcomers to the technology. Um, and so generally what I've found is there's, there's a plethora of helpful resources out there um, alongside products, say, and you know, if, there, if there's a particular crypto blockchain that you want to interact with, there'll be a helpful learning page or an education page or a video to, to describe the basic technology. It's, it's one of the things we're working on in mm -hmm. Coinly is you know, how we update our education and blogs to really cover that you know, basic stuff and what accountants need to know as well. Um, so generally, I found that across the board with a lot of companies in the space. Okay. Um, but I mean, there's no one resource that you would recommend either one of you for a for, you know, typical practitioner to just kind of understand how to treat things and w what the major issues are. Well, it, um, it is, no, it's a sad short answer at this point. I mean, it's, yeah. all these standards are still being set. Yeah, okay. Is there anything on the, if we look at the way Australia is going about it, is there any, how does it compare to the rest of the world that we just following and, and seeing? Are we leading in anything or is it just... Michael, I'm Michael, 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 I want to start this off and you two can please. So we've been, uh, we were in um, Austin, Texas for the, uh, the conference there and then also in New York for the NFT conference. Um, there is unbelievable work being done around the world. It's extraordinary what's being done and it's fantastic to see. Uh, Australia, we can put ourselves you know, up there, we're fantastic. The issue that we, we have, of course, is um, um, our, our uh, regulatory and our uh, um, governance of this. Um, there are more attractive areas around the world that are fostering this, and we seem to be a bit slow to, to the party on this. 
and it's a, it is a great concern. I mean, I've had a, a client, we have clients coming to us, Michael, and, and um, Mike and Danny would know this, is that we have clients coming to us and saying, well, we're going to set up overseas. Uh, I said, where are you going to live? He said, oh, we're going to live here. I said, well, how's that possible? I mean, where's your dominant? Um, I said, the ATO is not going to happen with uh, like any of that. And I said, so we've had clients move to Germany, physically up and get, move to Germany, and because of their C GST uh, treatment there is very happy. Or well, we've had clients that are considering Saudi Arabia or other other areas of, of the world. And they're doing that because mm -hmm. the, the, tax, the tax compliance and the tax... Uh, all the rules and regulations are much more conducive for what they're trying to do. And that's the big risk that we have here in Australia, that we may lose a lot of that quality people to us. Are they conducive well, or are they just Well, that's looser? a very good point. I think... No, they're conducive. So in that, in that example... No, 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 no. Sorry, I'll go in there. In that example, that, that client also went and spoke to Bragg. Sorry, I went to Senator Bragg and met with him and he, gave, he held it up as an example where... They said, look, it took us weeks to get legal advice on the Australian regulatory position, which came back as, look, there's an arguable position here, but there's a bunch of risk, and three days to have an answer from the German regulator BaFin saying, what you propose to do is we have no problem with it whatsoever. Mm. So we also have, unfortunately, baked into how some of our regulators are designed to operate, and it's not the fault of necessarily those working inside the regulators. Their mandate is not to tell people that it's all fine and, and, and okay to do something, that's not, they don't see that as their job, uh, and they don't have the political direction to do so in the same way that the ATO, you have to go get a private ruling that takes a long time to get an answer. And my understanding is near no private rulings in relation to crypto have come back saying, yes, what you'd like to do should be treated as how it has been suggested it should be treated, which is, is challenging because they also have an education gap. So there are jurisdictions which are welcoming and positively give clarity on the matter, and sometimes that clarity is we're fine with what you're doing. You might call it looser, but... Um, LUSA implies, you know, that they have more freedom around it, but that then goes to questions of like, well, is it necessary to have restrictions on these things in the first place? And some and some jurisdictions have taken a very tight approach and gone, well, we don't want anyone doing anything like this. Like, look, hmm. the US has driven away a lot of crypto businesses because they've said, we think almost any kind of token is probably a security. The UK, by contrast, has said, tokens are almost always property, and you need something else before it becomes a financial product or security. And, of course, that, that sent a lot of crypto business to the UK, not because it's looser, but because well, their regulators yeah, seem to have analysed the problem. Well. They've, they've, well, they've just analysed it and, in my view, come up with the correct analysis, whereas over in America you have a um, regulator whose job is to hit the security nail with a hammer, and when you have a hammer, everything starts to look like a security nail, whereas the UK <laughs> regulator is a bit broader and doesn't just deal with purely that function. In America, it's split with CFTC and SEC arguing over who should have jurisdiction and the US Congress addressing it now. And in the UK, it seems to have been a bit more sensible approach, looking at things with really learned input mm. from, you know, it's just a different legal system as well, which makes it a little bit easier to manage. But um, it's not a question of looser or tighter because it's a question of what requires what level of regulation. Yeah. You know, fundamentally, most financial services regulation is about somebody has the opportunity to steal money or value or property from someone else. Therefore, we have rules around it. The curious part of crypto is you have a whole lot of transactions able to be done in a way that there is no more third party who could steal the thing. Therefore, it raises a question in many cases of how, what's the use of some laws that are designed to protect a central intermediary from stealing someone's assets when they don't exist anymore in a system. We don't, the reason we don't have rules over, you know, certain rules over peer-to-peer -peer transactions, if I was to give you money to buy me coffee, is because they're just not needed. And in the crypto world, certain things that once upon a time there might have been required to have an intermediary there who obviously needed licensing and controls and whatnot, it's just not there anymore. So it's, it's a real case of the regulations not keeping up with the technology, which is enabling a brand new way of doing something that was never possible before. I mean, you say there's no third party or intermediary, but really, if you think about it, you know, if, whether you're stacking or doing anything, there's always some sort of platform that you're using that's designed by an intermediary. And therefore, you know, when you have a whole bunch of scammers that do the rug pull or anything else, you could regulate as much as you want to prevent consumer, like basically consumer protection. Um, that's, but that's entirely different. And in Australia, it's still completely illegal to engage in misleading and deceptive conduct, whether you are a business taking pre-sales of something yeah. or a token offerer framing a token as a pre-sale of something. 
there's, there's, those are regulated. So when people say crypto is the wild west and unregulated, I say nonsense. We have the strictest consumer protection law in the world. The question of whether or not the ACCC is going to get up and sue people is a different question, but it's the same question. True. Uh, the, the best, one of the best ways I find to analyze you know, crypto is to take away the technology and insert some other example mm. and say, okay, well, if this was a sack of wool, how would the transaction look? And a lot of barter, barter rules and analysis at the accounting level, it's a similar approach to say, okay, take the tech out of it and try and make it simple because you'll do your head in. Yes, if you're giving some asset to someone else and they're paying you some kind of return, if I give you a sack of wool and you're going to give me back the sack of wool with more wool, then you can work out an analysis on that to say, well, what does that look like? But that's a, that's a counterparty. If you look at something to say, there's a smart contract which will hold my money in escrow until you do something and I push a button and you push a button that releases it, uh, the analysis might be, okay, that's no difference to a, a safety deposit box that we each have a key. Okay, somebody made it, but if it sits on the ground and we both engage in a transaction with that box, there's no way to regulate the box because there's no operator of the box. It's just a thing that does does a particular thing if we both insert the keys. Um, so first question, as you rightly say, is, is there a counterparty that could be regulated and why would you regulate them? And if it's just a counterparty who's in a tra contractual transaction, they're under regulation and law already. Mm. But uh, there are scammers, and scams are just as illegal. Ponzi scheme is just as illegal whether it uses crypto or whether it, like most of them, pretend to use crypto in, 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 to try and get people to hand money over. Most of these Ponzi schemes involving crypto and things don't actually take crypto from people. They just say, you can make great returns, give us money and you'll get Bitcoin. And no one's ever getting any crypto in it at all. They're just handing over money and getting scammed. We see them come in every week. And they often trot off to ASIC to say, I'll oh, file a complaint there. And I say to them, don't, go to the police. The police deal with scams where people are stealing money, which is what it is. It's often variants of the Nigerian prince yeah. or classic um, pyramid schemes. And they have nothing to do with crypto other than they're using the excitement of a market. But really, there's nothing if, they can do, the police, ASIC or anyone, because it's all international and it's all... If people, are in, if people are going to unfortunately be foolish enough to send their money on the promises of someone who's overseas without a thought, a care in the world... That's, that I see as an education piece because that's the same problem. Before crypto, Western Union was used heavily by overseas scammers, mm. but because it was Western Union, you have to get up and walk down the road and actually do it at a location. That's how Nigerian prince scams flourished, was using money remitters in legitimate ways and with legitimate recipients, but in a way that made it very expensive to enforce internationally. So some parts of crypto have made certain transactions cheaper that have allowed scams to flourish, but to my mind, education's the answer. And should that education um, be coming from the accounting yeah. kind of fraternity? It has, at this point, it has to, and it comes from the lawyers as well, because we in a, are in a valued position of being trusted by our clients and helping them out. And if someone comes in and says, I'm going to do X, we can smell a rat. Correct. But the problem, Mark, is, mm. to see if something the problem is that yeah. the knowledge then, isn't quick. there at the minute, and, um, and this is why it's so important for yeah. the accountants and lawyers not in the space to get educated, because... Uh, they're dismissive of it or they don't understand it and it's becoming quite frustrating for the clients and, and clients need to understand that the same principles that what Michael said is that, you know, you've got to be educated in what you're investing in and what you're doing and, and understand what the rigors are in and go to someone educated and get that, you know, I've, you know, for someone spending, you know, 500,000 on investment or a million on investment and not paying a fee to see a professional is to me, um, Insane. But I can't have been asking their clients, like, hey, by the way, you know, is that, is that in a normal terms of engagement or form? Do they send out going, hey, do yeah. you own any crypto or digital assets? Yeah. Like, is that even a thing that's happening right now? Or are they just waiting for clients to, to tell them that, by the way, I've kind of done a little bit of staking and earned a little bit of here or there? Yeah, we did a survey recently around you know, the drivers for accountants getting into the crypto space. And what we found is that people aren't actively tracing crypto clients or jobs in the crypto space because they're super passionate about it or they want to expand their business, but they're actually being driven by demand. You know, their existing client base has come to them with issues in the crypto space. And I suspect it's the same mm -hmm. in the law space as well. And so that what, that what that does is for accountants to do their due diligence and have that duty of care as they normally would, they have to um, start with the education piece. They have to ask these questions up front. Do you hold crypto? And you know, there's there there are a lot of horror stories of you know accountants coming at the eleventh hour, asking you know, is there anything else you need to declare? And someone saying, yeah, I've got a bit of crypto, and it just creates that nightmare. So 
Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely a mix out there. Obviously, accountants like Greg are, are focusing more on the crypto side, but there's definitely accountants that um, are shying away from, from the crypto space, but more and more finding they've got a client base that demands those services. Mm. And what should an accountant do when one of, you know, they don't know nothing about crypto, don't know that much about it, and, you know, it's their 11th hour and they go, anything else we need to know about it? Like, oh, yeah, I've got a bit of crypto, of, you know, earned about 200 grand in well, debt Michael, income or some, you know, uh, my Dogecoin right. is now worth a million. Just, we, we, in an honest way, there's going to be a lot of traditional accountants are not going to get the crypto space or understand the Web3 space, and that's fine. Um, mm. And but so what they can do is then you know we've we've had that where clients then will, they'll refer the client to us and ask us to help them and that's fine. But I think I think um, there will be an overwhelming amount of demand and exactly what Danny said it'll be a driver especially the next generation coming through will want accountants to be all over the space and um, and it's probably where. If you're running your practice, that you want you all of your your staff to have some sort of an understanding of how that that occurs um, and what happens, or, or put them through a course. There are course. By the way, we act for seven professors in the industry, and and some of them um, at the RMIT blockchain, very very educated men, and they've they've put a course in for blockchain as well. The masters in it, Michael. There's a masters in blockchain, um, and there's. Mm. Why not? And then there's, uh, study, there's so also a, a tax professor there uh, as well um, in, in the blockchain space. So there's, there's 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 room for a lot of education, formal education, if they wanted to put people through through that sector to understand it as well. I was just going to add to that. There's there's a bit, when you, when accountants are looking at the business side and you know working on their business, not just doing their business of, of accounting, looking at what, what the makeup of the client industries are. There's going to be accountants who, this is utterly not relevant, hmm. who say, no, nope, we work in X industry, and by the time blockchain gets in there, you know, say construction, right? By the time blockchain tools are in there, it's going to be another piece of software that helps make things faster and might make security of payments not an issue anymore. Um, other industries, particularly if accountants who work with tech startups, yeah. which, um, you know, the number of people getting employed in tech startups and the, and the boom of tech, you can see what's happening. Deloitte's put out projections to how many jobs are going to be created in this mm. space. So an accounting business or even a sole practitioner accountant who says, where am I targeting and what's, what are the growth areas I want to be involved in? They're going to be driven by their yep. interests. But they're also going to see it pop up and be client driven. We're seeing increasingly, you know, family offices and high net worth say, we're going to put, you know, we're crazy not to put 1% or 2% of our net wealth into this. We're also seeing lots more products like Bitcoin ETFs and things coming out, which will make it easier for accountants because that puts a wrapper with a traditional interface fix care of all mm. the tech problems and, and makes it nice and easy. So there's, there's some of these tools will make certain things easier. Other, other problems are still going to be super hard. So it's okay. not something to be scared of for many accountants. It's just about what do they want as part of their practice and where do they want to advise on and what do they like to do? Because yeah. I love the space, right? So it's it, you know, going to work as a delight for me on this space versus <laughs> once upon a time I did other areas of law that perhaps every day wasn't as, as like, awesome. But Everybody loves something different. Some people here might rather shoot themselves in the head than deal with crypto every day and they're just here to go, I'm a little curious, I'll check it out. Yeah. Oh, it's all for scammers. Fine. They'll be educated eventually or they'll, you know, wave as perhaps one day I drive past in well, a I mean, um, <laughs> It's all becoming mainstream because like when, when ANZ has released the uh, stablecoin, RBA is looking into it. Uh, Common Bank wanted to release an app to, you know, to be able to trade. Um, you touched on something about the, the corporate side of things. And, and tech. Now, I've read like companies are even paying staff in, in crypto, etc. How does that work from a taxation perspective, a regulatory perspective, when companies are choosing to painful is a short yeah, answer. Yeah, like buy, <laughs> you know, accept payments for for goods well, and services and pay well, their accepting staff. Pa so accepting payments is easy. We've we've been accepting crypto for a long time. Now, I wish I could talk the partners of the firm into holding on to it because all these people think we're stupidly wealthy because we took a whole lot of Bitcoin and Ethereum back in the day. Of course, it was flipped by a gateway into cash the next day. So, okay. um, and you were treated as cash or as a trading stock? Like how, how does... Well, it's just, it's just revenue. So we use a company, you know, shout out to RelayPay, who've been a very reliable gateway for us. They, list, they, they support over 20 different cryptos, and we don't need to worry about it. All they do, someone comes along to the page, punches in the bill number, punches in what they want to pay, sends the crypto, we get one-day um, settlement, and the fee is less than taking a credit card. So... There's actually a big incentive if you are dealing with crypto clients yes. 
and they say, do you want to pay by crypto or by credit card? For goodness sake, get a gateway set up for your business so you're saving money. Because then it's, it's really, if the business driver isn't there, then crypto doesn't make sense. But if it does make sense to say, awesome, I don't need to actually hold the crypto and have a wallet. I don't need to muck around. Great. That's awesome if you want to be educated. But starting to do it as a, as a way of receiving income. What if you income. didn't convert it to cash the next day? What if you held on to it like you said you guys should have? How do you... Well, basic principle would be book it as... It's exa- use the barter principle. So I say to people, right, if I, did a, if I was a sole practitioner yeah. and I, I, you know, I'm Saul Goodman and I do a job for someone and get paid in a car, they go, I'll give you my car instead of paying yeah. the bill. It's an awesome convertible and you'll love it. And I look at it and go, all right, the bill's 20 grand, the car's worth 20 grand, done. Barter rules apply. I'm going to have to report that 20 grand as income because that's what my bill was that was settled. Now, I might have settled it for accepting a sweet car and then hang on to it for six months. It turns out it's a really unique, valuable car. There's not many of them. Someone comes along and goes, awesome, I'll pay you 30 grand for that car. Well, suddenly I'm making a capital gain on the thing that I reported as revenue, that, yeah. I, that I got in, in payment of a bill. So that's a really easy example, but it gives a principled way of looking at it. Take the check out, put something else in that makes sense to you in your head, and you can get a fair way down a lot of the analysis. That that's, uh, gets rid of the conceptually hard part. doesn't get rid of the part that things like Coinly deal really well with, which is volume of someone comes in and goes, I have 15,000 transactions. Help me sort them out. Um, or why do I have to pay for a bookkeeper to spend 20 hours on this? They don't. They could use an awesome service to, to cut to the chase on and work out where things are sitting properly. And, um, and, and that's where that we sort of can draw a line of which way do you go and start to unpack the complexity. It's not so scary then. You're eating an elephant one bite at a time. What about paying staff? Is that just a non-monetary benefit? Do you pay FBT on that? How does that... Yeah, there's there's fridge benefit tax issues. Um, A lot of businesses, unfortunately, come in and treat it as if it should be like an ESOP. There are ways to deal with it. Mm -hmm. There are ways that if you get in and do it right from the start, have better outcomes. Can can you pay your staff minimum wage for kind of labor law rules and then the rest of the, you know, pay? There are rules about, you know, and again, it goes back to bag of wolves days. There are rules about whether you can force staff to accept something instead of money. Um, And general, spoiler alert, you can't. But um, there are ways to structure it if your staff want to, but you can't force them to do it. But if they want to. But we tend to find it's more a case of staff want to do this um, and yeah, there are real challenges of once a token is out there and has value and deeming, you know, deemed value rules that come in. It gets complex fast because we don't have rules and we'll, it'll take a while for rules to be set. Board of Taxation is looking at CGT things. And it, an awesome position would be like the US proposed regulations, which simply say, here's a dollar amount. If it's below that dollar amount, forget about it. We don't care. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not a CGT event so long as it's underneath, every transaction's underneath that amount. We don't think you're doing a cheeky breaking it up into small transactions to defeat the rules. Um, if that act passes there, they'll have a wonderful net that just saves time and money because you get back to this philosophy of legislative design. Yeah. You don't want to make a, a, a piece of law that costs more than, than it benefits to um, enforce, and something like that in Australia would make a lot of sense. Instead of having a, is it a personal use asset? Oh, how long did you hang on to that Bitcoin? Are you using it for food a year <laughs> later? Oh, did you spend it fast enough? I think it'd be vastly better if we simply said, pick a number or pick an indexed amount. If it's below that amount, forget about it. Then accountants know and they can say, great, here's, here's what we can do around transactions. They can use tools to manage yeah. that, make everything simpler, but still have a fair amount that works. Mm. So you're, you know, you're, you're not running into effectively you know, foreign exchange kind of challenges in your accounting all the time. Yeah, okay. Um, Danny, with Coinly, is there, are there any risks around yeah, connecting so your wallet just to, and Coinly. Exchanges to Coinly? Like, can, can someone hack it? Can yeah, you lose yeah. anything? I guess does, firstly, does it you know, open you up to more so ATO issues? We're effectively it's all out a there. portfolio tracking solution that uses what's called API, which is essentially a connector into your wallets, blockchain, exchanges, all your integrations. Um, and so around how the data is pulled, a lot <laughs> of the, all the APIs generated will be read-only. So for example, if you own the wallet or the keys, the private keys to the crypto or you own the exchange account, you can generate an API that's set to be accessed on a read-only basis. Um, so it's very, very secure. Okay, and quick question for Michael. With the sort of ATO and their approach, how heavy handed are they? And like, how how wide are their tentacles in terms of the data match? Like, do they just know that you have an account on exchange, or do they actually know values and transactions? No, data matching is is transactions. Transactions. So they know values so and transactions. They they can use their yeah. So they uh, you know their data matching has been in place for years. Any client should assume 
you know, all transactions done on centralized exchanges that are in Australia or registered with Austrac have you just assume that it's been approached by the ATO and the data sharing and that they're being asked every year to hand over transaction data because that's what the ATO does is they collect the information to make sure that yeah. there's some check. However, you know, between the exchanges publishing, okay, here's a tax report and being able to put those wallets and transactions into services like Coinly, then people can get to a point of, of showing, should they come under audit, that they took reasonable steps. I think it's still early enough that the ATO is not being difficult they are, if someone is being cheeky, they're going to have a much harder time than if they can say, as Greg pointed out earlier, you know, the reverse onus is not just a, um, have you done exactly the right thing? We don't, we're lucky that we don't have a tax office that is incredibly difficult in trying to trip people up. Mm. Um, in all the public appearances the ATO have done around crypto, they have, they have essentially said, look, this is new. We're all learning as fast as we can. There are gaps. So we always say to clients, you want to be able to show that you've tried to do the right thing and where there is a discretion, you've tried to meet the spirit of the law and you've tried to get to where it ought to be. You know, the castle set us out the vibe and we say that to clients. You know, if, if, you, know, if you think it's cheeky, it probably is. <laughs> and if the ATO comes in and it looks cheeky and it smells funny, expect a certain kind of response versus if you say, here's what I did, here are the, here are the things that I thought through and considered the issues and tried to do it as reasonably as possible. Yeah. That's, that's always going to be better when you're dealing with a regulator. Have you seen much? Particularly if you end up on the wrong side. Have you seen much tax controversy to date, like in terms of ATO going, hey, we matched it, you didn't declare anything, we... It's happening. They've, they have announced publicly that they've sent out a whole lot of letters, and they've been very polite letters saying, hi, we, we know you've been doing things in crypto, but it, you didn't report it on your tax return. Did you want to have another go at this? <laughs> um, and... That's a very polite way of the ATO saying, we're coming, fess up now, and we'll let you go back and, am and amend your tax return. And there's obviously periods of time you can go back and amend. Yeah. And so I expect, I, I think it's one of these situations that we say, expect in the future for things to become a lot tighter. Um, obviously, they're going to target people who are doing silly things and at larger numbers to send a message. That will happen sooner or later. But Michael, how does it work uh, with is like foreign like exchanges overseas that are not under Australian jurisdiction, plus also like just a whole bunch of DeFi platforms that are kind of off exchanges. Uh, well, DeFi platforms are generally on public ledgers. So but once the wallets are identified, uh, there is an increasingly wallets are doxed and identified. So clients should assume they're going to get doxed and thus assume that their dealings in DeFi are going to be discovered and discoverable. And with things like in the future cash or being or locked down. Now, like when you say they're being well, discoverable. Well, you're dealing, they, they're dealing with an immutable record. Yeah. So five years from now, the ATO, if it finds out what your wallet is in five years from now, can go back and rebuild what the transactions were and can say, hey, and this wallet did a whole bunch of CGT and you were living here and filing tax returns, yet you didn't report any of it. Yeah. Why didn't you do that? Exactly. So that's the future. Uh, and that's, it hasn't happened yet. It's not happening. Because they can't track it right now. It's entirely trackable right now. As the in the ATO. Trackable. ATO is not, not getting the information from necessarily from anything outside of exchanges, as far as I understand. But they don't need to because if it's a public chain, they can get it whenever they want. Okay. So I think you assume that their capabilities are beyond what they're saying publicly because they are still learning. But when you have Chainalysis and other tracking companies also indicating in their public documents that their biggest customers are government, mm. They are training the police. They are training ATO and tax. This is an area, as it gets bigger and bigger, that will gain more and more scrutiny from those regulators, and the government will increasingly say, how ought this be taxed? I saw a question pop up in the thread about how should NFTs be taxed. And there, we're seeing issues of that and looking at that at the moment around where does, the, you know, where does GST fall on NFTs, particularly around Netflix tax and things like that. Um, and obviously many NFT projects would rather there not be GST on what they're, on what they're doing. But there may well be GST on a whole lot of NFT projects that may not have collected it in the first place. We've seen projects that have just said, we're just going to eat it and pay the GST for everyone, no matter where they were. And others try and figure out where their customers were later because they didn't, they didn't check up front because you have this pseudo-anonymous issue. So there's really challenging issues coming out of things like that mm. where um, you, you, you have to deal with these things. And I've drafted a num you know, immeasurable numbers of NFT terms. And often we try and shift the tax risk onto the buyer, but you don't know who they are. <laughs> if you don't know who they are, it's pretty hard to go after them to get that indemnity. So, so there's practical issues as round, you know, these little key points that have to be unpacked. So should you charge GST or not? Um, depends what the NFT is, but there's a, it's a real issue that's got to be unpacked carefully. And if you're just selling a very expensive JPEG NFT from an Australian entity, then your Australian purchases are highly likely to be 
liable to be charged GST on those purchases. Mm. If you're selling it to overseas people, it's far more likely that the GST is not going to be applicable to those. But very few platforms and systems that deal with the sale of NFTs yeah, take okay. that in now. So there's gaps. There's going to keep being gaps, especially when you'll see, you know, when an existing ticketing company rolls NFTs into their products, of course they're going to charge GST on it because they did ordinarily. So watch all the tickets turning to NFTs in the next two to three years, and that'll be easy. And that's an, that's a don't worry about it, accountants. The same accounting will apply for that sort of thing. It's the more exotic products that will, will start to raise weird problems in accounting that will, will raise strange challenges. And luckily we've got people like Danny and Greg thinking really hard about it and then... <laughs> throwing the really hard ones to us to try to deal with, <laughs> to work through with them to try and puzzle it out later and then get what can be automated. We're automated. talking about the tax treatment of... Is there a quick it, answer um, to that, Danny? And, and or, or Michael? Going in and then exiting. Massively complex issue to go through and the nature of it. I don't think it's a quick answer on that. Uh, uh, Danny, unless you've got a quick, super difficult it's one. It's a difficult one. Yeah, it, it's, it's a super difficult one, yeah. I, th I think for the time being, if people are staking and receiving a... You know, an interest rate return. Their best move Correct. is to report that in income. Correct. But you do have these tricky problems about when you're putting the things into a liquidity pool and you're not pulling out exactly what went in around when was there a disposal. You know, we've seen comments on the ATO community portal saying when you move crypto to an exchange, it's a disposal because they've read the rules strictly and go, well, no one's treating it like that, mm. including the ATO, because that's not what it is. However, in, you know, if you look at it technologically, crypto is being mixed with other crypto when it goes onto an exchange, albeit it's usually custodied separately, but your yeah. one Bitcoin you move on to an exchange generally isn't being segregated as your one Bitcoin. It might be put in a pool mm. with 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 okay. Bitcoin, because that's how they work technologically. So these problems need to be worked out. But yeah, liquidity pools are a real challenge. Um, they ju they're, they're, yeah, they're really, really, really difficult ones so that we you can unpack them and try and put together a reasonably arguable position, but they're also nuanced as well, but the devil yeah. is in the detail. Every single one is a little bit different. You know, usually Uniswap is held up as a good example because yeah. they have the most common standards of those liquidity pools. Um, but that seems to be the tax, Asian, the tax of, you know, ATO to the extent they have a position seems to be, and, and I'd certainly be encouraging people, better report that income as income because it is, yeah. and then figuring out what's in there in a capital gain and when that occurs. Is, a, is still a tricky point. It may be the ATO is satisfied with when, when you pull stuff out of a liquidity pool, did you make or lose money? Is that the CGT event? Mm -hmm. um, because it's simply so hard to tell if every single time someone in, else interfaces with the liquidity pool on the other side, you have a paper gain or loss. Extraordinarily difficult to then try and map that through when you haven't realized it. So I'm hopeful that the Board of Taxation is going to think about those kinds of things and try and come up with a, what's a real CGT event or have a CGT event treatment of digital assets that, that makes sense in terms of what they're practically being used for rather than a highly technical one that creates a multitude of taxing events yep. that even with something as powerful as Coinly or other platforms just don't work and mean that Australians go, well, this is impossible to deal with. Um, because that's just going to force people into saying, oh, awesome, I'll just have to go invest in an offshore fund which does this so I don't have all the pain of the transactions. Um, and then have a, a whole bunch of risk of using offshore tools to do that simply to avoid a, a cost here. And that's that tricky balance is how easy it is to go offshore and deal with people offshore and the risk of scams jumps up doing that that the government has to deal with. And I don't envy their, their job, but we certainly um, try and help out wherever we can to make sure it goes in the right direction. Like you mentioned, uh, like, like Tornado this like morning was, uh, yeah, thing, sanctioned. Yes. So there, there are ways, uh, I guess, companies are, well, or people are using kind of anonymous coins as well to... Sure, but you know, if if five percent of people buy gloves to cover their fingerprints while they commit crimes, should we ban the use of gloves? Like, there's a real yeah, policy. I like that analogy. It's a good one. Well, the data and the data is that 11 percent of the money going through Tornado Cash is from hacks and crime. Yeah. Like Tornado Cash, since February, was using Chainalysis's Oracle of known dirty wallets, which OFAC gave the information to Chainalysis to publish to automatically block um, dirty addresses. So I, I'm pretty down on OFAC's um, move there. I think it's a terrible move. Mm. They're sanctioning code, which doesn't work because you can't stop it. And they already had a path where if they were doing a really good job of, of highlighting addresses as fast as they were identified as dirty, by automation, Tornado Cash was blocking those. Those addresses, however, weren't blocked at the time the money moved through them, perhaps because government didn't move fast enough. So there's a lot of policy issues that fall out of it. But given that, you know, on an ongoing basis, something like 90% of the use of Tornado Cash was entirely legitimate, um, it seems like a very heavy-handed, over-the-top approach. Plus, anyone can co copy and paste the source code from Tornado Cash and launch another one and call it 
Krista cash, which isn't subject to sanctions whatsoever. It's all over the so it's also a whack a whack a mole problem that, that that I think is a is going to create a lot of unintended consequences. But that's just what we see in regulation, and, and there's a lot of we'll probably see some lawsuits over this with people alleging that code is speech and thus protected under the U.S. First Amendment. <laughs> we don't have that in Australia. Our freedom of speech is limited to political speech. Um, but if that goes through and forces OFAC to take it off the list because of something like that, that'll be interesting. That would also yeah, relieve pressure. Guys, thank you so much for your time on the panel and Excellent. for everyone that's tuned in to listen to us.